I uh, do not have a microphone, so I'm going to use my best stage voice. That kind of worked. All right. Uh, we want to welcome you to the Joliet Area Historical Museum on this beautiful spring day. Uh, great to see so many of you here with us. Um, first acknowledgement I'd like to make, how many members do we have here today, museum members? All right. Wow. We really like to see that. Well, we want to thank you guys first uh, for making events like this possible, for really making our museum possible. Um, and if you're not a member, you should feel a lot of pressure after that show of hands. So uh, I promise you membership. If you come to half of our events throughout the year, your membership's going to pay for itself. Um, so now that I've made that plug, I uh, would like to acknowledge a couple people we have with us today. Um, I know there is at least one elected official, and if I overlook anyone else, I apologize. But uh, State Senator Pat McGuire is here today. We thank you for coming, Senator. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, two museum board members we have here today. Val Rand is here and Dr. Dennis Kremen on our board. J.D. Ross, who's also a former board of member, director. Um, and the staff made this all possible. Um, everyone on our staff, thank you. You guys all did excellent work, as always. Uh, final acknowledgement is, uh, again, Dr. Kremen with the History Center at Lewis for uh, really making the emergence of modern Joliet exhibit possible. Um, helping us to deliver what's what's a really cerebral, outside-the-box exhibit. I'm very proud of that to be my first one here as director. Um, and another quick plug, uh, you got these coming in. If you'd like more, we're asking for a uh, $5 donation, which will go to the History Center who had these printed um, and who put a lot of time and resources into the exhibit upstairs. So um, with all that said, um, I'm shortly going to introduce Kim, our education director, who will introduce Dr. Sterling. But before I do that, I would like to thank Dr. Sterling. Um, I don't know if he knows this, but when I interviewed here, I snuck in the weekend before and picked up a copy of a pictorial history of Joliet, one of his books, for my interview preparation. Uh, <laughs> and obviously, that worked out for me, so thank you, Dr. <laughs> uh, so with that, enjoy the presentation. And I'm going to introduce Kim, who will uh, tell you a little bit about our speaker today. Take it away. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim. I'm the education director. And uh, this is the last in a series of programs that we have in conjunction with the exhibit, um, The Emergence of Joliet. Uh, after the exhibit, we are going to have a couple of things going on. We have book signings. I know some of you brought your books from home to have signed. Elaine is selling books uh, at the back of the room as well. And then we do also invite you to go up and see the exhibit if you've not seen it. Uh, make your way through the galleries. We are open until 5 o'clock, so after the exhibit or after the lecture is done, uh, you are free to tour the museum and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon here. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Bob. Uh, he has been uh, instrumental in the development of the museum and in the success of the museum. And uh, so many of you called, and he has so many friends here, and people were so excited. And I heard all kinds of stories about when he was young. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really scandalous, though, so I don't know. <laughs> so at this point, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Sterling and let him take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Uh, it's uh, good to be back in Joliet. Oh. <laughs> Oops. Hey, I've been gone seven years. Give me a break. Uh, Colorado is beginning to feel comfortable, but uh, there's really no place like home, and Joliet will always be home. Um, besides the uh, beautiful mountain scenery in Colorado, there are a couple of things that I really love about Colorado, and uh, they are John and Juliet, our two grandchildren. So. Uh, it uh, is why Joanne and I decided to go to Colorado and uh, leave behind so many friends, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, it's uh, great to see all of you. If I would start mentioning certain people by name and church relationships and friendships from the college and so forth, I know I would leave most people out. I know uh, uh, the senator was mentioned. Uh, actually, Pat 
uh, McGuire proofread one of my books. So if there are any errors in it, um, uh, I wouldn't withhold a vote for that reason, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> it's good to see you, Pat. Um, as I said, uh, John and Juliet were uh, the two main reasons why Joanne and I decided, well, they were the two reasons why Joanne and I decided to go to Colorado. And, uh, you know, grandchildren are, are truly God's compensation for growing old, or at least older. And uh, so we've had uh, a lot of fun with the grandkids. You know, John is a typical nine-year-old boy. He loves cars. He has an interest in outer space. And I know he'd love the Hobolt Apollo exhibit. Um, I can't uh, wait for John to come to the museum. I've told him all about the economy car and that I actually rode in it before the museum acquired it. I know he'd really enjoy seeing the car for himself. And my granddaughter, Juliet, I've told her that the city where Poppy was born, that's me, this Dr. Sterling stuff, I haven't heard that in <laughs> years, it's Poppy. Uh, I've told Juliet that the city where I was born was first Juliet, Illinois, and then they changed it to Joliet. She can't understand why anyone would change such a pretty name like Juliet <laughs> to Joliet or Joliet. So, uh, and I, you know, I kind of agree that Juliet is a very pretty name. But she is quite proud to know that uh, my hometown was named after her. Uh, <laughs> by the way, there are a few people here from the class of 60, and I uh, understand you plan to visit Colorado. I'd just like to caution you that there are limits on how much recreational marijuana you can buy. <laughs> It is kind of risky to try to bring home any edible souvenirs. So just a <laughs> word of caution, classmates. Uh, while driving uh, here from Colorado, <clears throat> I listened to a lot of radio, including one station that uh, shared the following story. It seems that little Billy only went to church on Easter Sunday. Easter's coming up, but that's the only time his parents went. And so his teacher had an Easter lesson and began by asking the class, um, who can tell us about the resurrection? And trying to make Billy feel welcome, she called on him first. Billy thought for a minute, thought, and he said, well, I really don't know a whole lot about that, but I think that if it lasts for more than four hours, you're supposed to go to the doctor. <laughs> that, was a, that was a religious station. I, but anyway, I think there is a moral to the story, and that is going to church once a year at Easter really isn't enough. But anyway, um, I was invited to uh, be with you today to talk about the emergence of modern Joliet from about the 1870s to the 1930s. Uh, special thanks to Kim who introduced me and to Heather here at the museum and Dr. Kremen from Lewis University. They were my contact people while I was putting the program together. Uh, the presentation today is intended to provide some historical context for the exhibit upstairs um, which features some tools in the museum's collection, as well as drawings that appeared in the Herald News, uh, drawings by Adele Faye Williams back in the 1920s and 30s. And so I was asked to do a program to kind of present uh, historical context. What was Joliet like as it uh, was leaving behind those early years and becoming more of a modern city? And so that's where we're going with the program today. In order to look at the emergence of modern Joliet, I think it's important to have a point of reference. What was it like before then? Uh, why is this more modern? And so we're first going to kind of step back, take a quick look at what it was like in the real early years, and then move ahead 
and take a look at Joliet during the period from the 1870s to the 1930s. Kind of a then and now approach. What a great idea. For a book even, huh? Who knows? Well, anyway. Um, the first settlers to move into this area are, uh, some of them are pictured here. This is the Will County Pioneers Association. Uh, in order to be a member of this group, uh, you had to have uh, lived in or moved to Will County before 1850. So these indeed are the real pioneers of the Will County Joliet area. Why did these people come to live in this area? Obviously, they were attracted by the rich soil to farm, but also by the rivers and creeks in the area. Uh, water was essential for class, drinking, body surfing, <laughs> uh, what else? <laughs> Cooking, uh, washing clothes, uh, power, water power. And so mills like this one, the Red Mill Company, along Hickory Creek were found during these early years. Uh, the Red Mill Company was located near the entrance to Highland Park at Route 30. And for a number of years it stood there. The sawmill uh, cut some of the timber for the first frame houses and businesses in Joliet and the grist mill ground grain for farmers that would uh, bring their grain to the Red Mill Company. In perhaps little series like this with the fringe on top if you take a look at it. The first uh, home in Juliet, got to throw that name in, sorry. Uh, that's what it was. The first home in Juliet was this log cabin built by Charles Reed in 1832 on the western bank of the Des Plaines River, kind of near the present day intersection of Bluff and Jefferson. Uh, taking advantage of a dam in the Des Plaines River, Reed started to build a mill. He didn't complete it. The following year, he sold out to James McKee, who went on to complete the mill and therefore to become probably uh, Joliet's first entrepreneur. On that side of the river, Bluff Street, we find the first business district. Um, following the lead of, of uh, Reed and, and McKee, others began settling on the side of town, and uh, Bluff Street was developed as the first business district. One reason being that on the other side of the river, on the east side, it was much lower, wetter, more prone to flooding, in fact, some people referred to it as the slough. And so Joliet developed first on the west side. This was the city's main intersection where the street light is. That was, back then, it was Bluff and Exchange Streets. Exchange became Jefferson Street. On that corner, that was the prime intersection. On the southwest corner stood this building, the first stone building built in Joliet, Martin Demond quarried stone from the nearby bluffs to build this structure and that provided really the impetus for other buildings to be built on Bluff Street. Uh, of course the region was predominantly agricultural but when farmers came to town this is where they came to Bluff Street. Across the street on the northwest corner stood the Barrett's hardware store. Um, it was, again, a prime location for a hardware, or any store for that matter. The old frame buildings pictured here, and the hitching rails, and the wooden sidewalks, and wooden crosswalks, uh, I think uh, give this uh, image kind of a, a pioneer look. On the other uh, side, uh, on the uh, northeast corner of that busy, uh, busy intersection was George Woodruff's drugstore. And from that vantage point, George Woodruff was a close observer of what went on in Joliet. And fortunately for us, he recorded it. Uh, the significance of the building was recognized by Adele Faye Williams, 
who drew this image of it in 1931 when it appeared in the Herald News. Uh, her wonderful drawings sometimes depict historically significant uh, structures, uh, some from the past and some from the time in which she lived, which was the 1920s and 30s. And on the other corner was the National Hotel. Uh, this is the southeast corner of that intersection. This was the city's first five-star hotel. You know, the kind of place with the big fluffy towels <laughs> that make it difficult to close your suitcase when you leave? <laughs> oh, some of you know, some of you know, I can see it in your eyes. Anyway, this is where the dignitaries stayed at this time when they passed through Joliet. And that included Abraham Lincoln. Uh, early records indicated that Lincoln stayed at the National, and even though he was known as Honest Abe, Lincoln was tempted to accidentally leave Joliet with one of those plush towels. On one occasion, it's rumored that he tried to squeeze one into his suitcase, but Mrs. Lincoln had packed the suitcase so full that it wouldn't fit. As I said, it's a rumor and probably started by Stephen Douglas or one of his uh, political <laughs> rivals. Anyway, when Lincoln checked out, he went across the street to the drugstore uh, and of course, uh, George Woodruff was the proprietor. I think he went over to buy some snacks for his trip. I, mean, I think Milk Duds and Laffy Taffy were a few of his favorites. But as he approached uh, Mr. Woodruff to pay for the candy, suddenly, the top of his hat burst open and out popped one of these fluffy monogram towels from the National Hotel. As you can imagine, obviously this is a story, huh? As you can imagine, Woodruff was flabbergasted and Lincoln was embarrassed and uh, um, Woodruff said, look, uh, someone's playing a prank on you. Obviously they, they, you know, you didn't know it. They stuffed this towel in here. Anyway, Woodruff said, I'll take it back to the National Hotel. Uh, let's move on to some more serious local history. <laughs> this again is Bluff Street. We're standing at the intersection of Bluff and Jefferson, looking north on Bluff. Uh, again, you can see, you know, a lot of carriages and, and uh, on, uh, uh, buggies in the streets. Uh, this is where folks came to shop. Dad always wanted to look around Barrett's and mom went to the dry goods stores and the kids, they went with, with uh, whichever parent was most likely to buy them some candy probably. Down on uh, a little farther north on Bluff Street stood this building. Um, this was known as Merchant's Row. It was a very historic structure in early Joliet. This is where J.D. Page uh, pioneered the production of carbonated beverages. Um, and once again, with an eye for historically significant structures, Adelphe Williams uh, drew this, and it was one of the images that appeared in the Herald News in 1926. The vast deposits of limestone underlying the Joliet area uh, gave rise to the first important industry during these early years, quarrying stone. Uh, the quarrying business uh, started fairly small since stone was used initially just for the construction of local buildings. However, when the I&M Canal was finished in 1848 and then the railroad steamed into town four years later, now Joliet stone could be shipped by water or rail throughout the region. And a lot of very important buildings, like the old state capitol in Springfield, was built of Joliet stone. Indeed, Joliet became known as the city of stone, or stone city. Most folks, however, didn't uh, work in the quarries. If they didn't farm, more than likely they worked in, in uh, some small uh, shop, uh, like this blacksmith shop on Bluff Street. Um, Places that uh, catered to farmers. Speaking of farming, the Joliet Manufacturing Company 
uh, produced uh, reapers and mowers and corn shellers for area farmers. Eventually the company specialized only in corn shellers, uh, like you see. Downey Brothers Horseshoeing and Carriages, another one of these small, you know, businesses. Um, they sold and repaired carriages, uh, shoed horses. They even had a used wagon lot for folks on a budget. Um, but you can see the, the carriage on the left was uh, probably a little classier than many. It had side curtains. Another one of these businesses would be the Van Fleet Machine Shop typical 19th century business, or uh, Grief Brothers Cooperage, which made barrels like those pictured here. The first brewery in Joliet was established on Bluff Street in 1838, but the brewing business really became important when Edwin Porter and Fred Searing began the brewing ale and beer. In 1859, Porter established the brewery on Bluff Street and uh, his delivery wagon uh, delivered these adult beverages to local saloons. Uh, Porter claimed that temperance men could drink his ale without suffering any fearful consequences thereof. <laughs> However, local temperance crusaders were not deterred in their opposition to the devil's drink. Uh, Fred Searing, um, he initially had uh, his brewery located at Bridge and Summit Streets, and although temperance people were pleased to see the breweries closed during Prohibition, they did play an important part in the economic and social history of uh, early Joliet. Sir, would you like a cigar with your drink? It's got to be good, it's made locally. These are employees of the Charles Achenbach Cigar Store and Factory, seen here making cigars. Uh, judging from the expressions and glistening foreheads, it was a smoking hot day when this picture was taken in July in Joliet. We need some of those smoking hot days now, don't we? After the winter we've had. Well, to restate the obvious, Joliet is a river town. If we step back and look up the Des Plaines River towards the Jefferson Street Bridge, we'll see this small island in the river, as well as the early development on the west side. For example, there are the twin towers on the far left in the, in the picture, the towers of Porter's Brewery. And if you look kind of straight ahead, you see a big windmill, that was the Leach Windmill Company. Leander Leach patented his windmill in 1871, and for several years, Leach was one of the largest manufacturers of windmills in the Middle West. Uh, the company's rooftop windmill was a distinctive uh, Joliet landmark until the building was destroyed by fire in 1916. It was 12 years in construction, but in 1848, the I&M Canal, the Illinois and Michigan Canal, opened and immediately began to transform the Joliet area. Uh, the I&M Canal linked uh, the Great Lakes, Joliet to the Great Lakes on one end, all the way to the Mississippi and down to the Gulf of Mexico on the other. And uh, suddenly Joliet was on this main transportation artery. Um, since there were dams in the river at Jackson Street and Jefferson Street, it was necessary to lock the boats, the canal boats, up and down at Jefferson and Jackson. And this is the lock at Jefferson Street. Uh, the house that you see there is where the lock tender lived. But with a steep hill bordering Bluff Street to the west, Expansion westward, obviously, was extremely difficult and very limited. And so commercial development moved instead to the east side of the river. The low wet areas were built up and then built on by enterprising businessmen. And so east side development soon rivaled and then surpassed 
what was going on over on Bluff Street. In fact, the, the first courthouse was built on the east side of the river. Uh, it was actually built uh, across from the present day public square. It, was, it faced uh, Chicago Street, kind of across from the public square. The building also served as the county jail with uh, cells really dug out of the rock in the basement. The second courthouse was built in 1848 to meet the needs of the growing county. This, the second courthouse, a little more picturesque, this one did stand on the public square uh, fronting Jefferson Street. You can see that first courthouse just uh, to the left of the front door across Chicago Street. It, was, it stayed there for a number of years. In fact, those cells uh, in the first courthouse were still used uh, for lockups, uh, uh, for, as I said, for a number of years. Um, the, the view is very interesting because, you know, obviously the streets aren't paved, there are puddles and mud every and but there are, there are tracks, streetcar tracks in the roadway. Um, in fact, there was a horse-drawn or mule-drawn streetcar system in Joliet from 1874 to 1890. Yes, there was public transportation, but certainly not a modern system yet. But we're still looking at this early period before Joliet enters the more modern era. As you might imagine, that rather quaint looking uh, building, the second courthouse, caught the eye, a picture of it anyway, of Adele Faye Williams. And this is her drawing of that uh, second courthouse. Incidentally, the row of buildings across from the courthouse uh, included a three-story building in the middle of the block which housed Barrett's Hardware. Barrett's moved from Bluff Street to the east side of town as the business district shifted eastward. And so uh, as the city moved east, so did companies like Barrett's. This early view of Ottawa Street perhaps best illustrates the downtown district during these early years before the emergence of modern Joliet. You have frame houses and small sheds, large churches, commercial buildings, all standing side by side. In the foreground is the Central Presbyterian Church. And in the distance to the left of that, kind of the unique structure on the left side, is St. John's Universalist Church. As you can see, it, it looks like a very interesting building. And wouldn't you know it, Adelphi Williams decided to treat readers in the Herald News to an image of St. John's Universalist Church. It stood on the corner where the auditorium building or Stillman's Drugstore, that building, it stood on that corner, this uh, uh, original St. John's Church. On Chicago Street, uh, one of my favorite pictures, you can see this is kind of close to uh, Chicago and Jefferson. You can see a bakery, the Swarthoots Bakery. But in the street, uh, a good part of the stagecoach can be seen. Uh, you know, I've collected, a, I don't know how many thousands of pictures over the years looking for images kind of interesting with a stagecoach or something. This is the closest, <laughs> the closest I've come to a stagecoach, uh, you know, in downtown Joliet. But uh, indeed, there was uh, a public transportation between towns and cities. Of course, it was by stagecoach during these early years. A popular stagecoach station east of Joliet was the Brick Tavern in New Lenox. Uh, this drawing by Adele Fay Williams in 1927 <laughs> captures this historic scene, a stagecoach approaching the Brick Tavern. Uh, as I said, a lot of her drawings depict this bygone era, kind of growing dim in the public memory uh, when uh, she did her drawings. Efforts to improve transportation in this area have been ongoing since it was first settled. For example, there was a toll road. You got it, a toll road 
made of wooden planks connecting Joliet and Plainfield in 1851. Toll houses like the one you see here were on, on uh, each end at each terminus and the cost was two cents a mile one way or if you want to pay for a round trip it was three cents a mile. Uh, the Plank Road era didn't last very long because of the cost of tolls. Uh, also the scarcity of hardwood like uh, maple and oak to build and maintain these plank roads. And also in the wet weather, water and mud had a tendency to squirt between the planks and it was kind of messy to travel on them. A major advancement in transportation occurred in 1852. That was only four years after the canal opened. The first train in Joliet was the Rock Island and it connected Joliet and Chicago and it brought, of course, Joliet in closer contact with Chicago and all that uh, that uh, relationship might, uh, might hold. Traveling by rail was much faster, much cheaper, and you could do it year round, which wasn't the case on the canal. Local leaders were so anxious for the Rock Island to be routed through Joliet that they granted the railroad a right of way right through the courthouse yard right through the public square. And uh, windows would rattle when court was in session. It was very exciting. Uh, but this uh, rather short-sighted concession was soon regretted when folks began to complain that some, tra uh, some trains went flying through town, that was a danger, or they stopped and tied up traffic for an hour, and that was a nuisance as well. And so f almost from the very beginning, you know, people notice the disadvantages of at least the routing of the railroad. Although these improvements certainly had an impact on uh, commercial development in the area, uh, the downtown area was still characterized by the old and the new, a mix of old frame buildings standing next to, you know, three-story limestone buildings like the GL Vance Furniture Store on Van Buren Street. I had to work this picture in. It's one of my favorites. I probably would not be here today talking to you if it wasn't for this one picture. And if we have time later, I'll share that story with you. Although Joliet historically was a blue collar town, the city boasted a very fine educational system, you know, even during this early period. Uh, this is the Joliet High School. It was on the corner of Chicago and Webster Streets. After school or on weekends, there were a few parks, not many. One was Bush Park, also known as West Park, a uh, favorite place for a picnic or walk on these roads and visit the spring house there. Out east of town, Highland Park, uh, especially in the winter, People like to skate on Hickory Creek, and once again, Adele Faye Williams captures some skaters. Uh, the dam, which I understand is at risk of being destroyed or removed, and in this, that's where the Red Mill was. The building there was that we started with the Red Mill Company. It stood there for about 100 years, a, a Red Mill. It burned down a couple times and was rebuilt, but that's what you see uh, in, the, in that picture. Although the fire department was composed largely of volunteers in these early years, its members did take special pride in their work and they competed in tournaments, for example. Uh, J.D. Page, the same guy who uh, pioneered the carbonated beverages, he's sitting at, in the chief's cart with the reins. Uh, there's a steam pumper and uh, uh, hose and, and ladder carts uh, uh, down the street. The fire department is pictured here in front of the station on Ottawa Street. There was a brass bell in the watchtower which was hammered with a mallet to summon firefighters in the event of a fire. The police department patrolled the city on foot. Uh, they used uh, telegraph call boxes on their beats to summon the station for assistance if backup was needed. 
their helmets and, and uh, coats are especially characteristic of this early period. The patrol wagon uh, depicted here was purchased when J.D. Page was chief of the police department. Guy moved around. He was very important to the history of this area. Uh, a contemporary publication noted that these backup officers were quite fresh and after an exhilarating ride to the scene. Curiously, this wagon was first used to haul a belligerent woman to the local lockup. You can't believe that. No, that, that's what this record said. The same one that talked about Lincoln in the <laughs> towel. I mean, <laughs> did I give you some comfort? <laughs> um, let's change direction and, and consider health care in Joliet. Since there were no hospitals during these early years, this old house, known as the Pest House, was used as a quarantine center for people who had contagious diseases. Originally, it stood on Walnut Street, where Ridgewood Park is located today. Uh, conveniently, there was a burial ground adjacent to the pest house. <laughs> Apparently, one's uh, chances of survival at the quarantine center weren't all that good. Uh, just down the Walnut Street Hill, across Cass Street, stood Oakwood Cemetery. It was established in 1855. Uh, as you know, the granite markers and, and uh, marble monuments there read like a who's who of early Joliet. The house you see inside the uh, cemetery uh, fence, just to the right of the entrance, was the Sexton's house. And if you'll permit me a personal note, my grandfather, Clarence Sterling, owned a flora shop on the corner of Cass and Walnut, and he was sexton of the cemetery for many years. In fact, when he took the position, that's where the Sterling family lived, in that house. And this is the Sterling family. Uh, my dad is the youngest. He is seen in the arms of his mother. In fact, my dad was born in Oakwood Cemetery in that house. So most people associate Oakwood with maybe the death of a loved one. I associate Oakwood with the birth of my father. <laughs> well, now let's pivot from old Joliet. Oh, let's move on. To modern Joliet, the emergence of modern Joliet. Um, the image of Will County's uh, new courthouse in 1887 really illustrates the transformation occurring in the Joliet region. From a rural oriented village to more of an industrial urban center, modern Joliet began to take shape. Um, an important key, I think, to understanding the emergence of modern Joliet is transportation. The electric, or the, the railway system, as I said, had been uh, mule-drawn, horse-drawn, but it was converted to electricity in 1890. And this is one of those crews converting the streetcar route uh, to uh, a more modern electric railway system. The growing network of streetcars tied together the outlying areas of Joliet as never before. Uh, it created streetcar suburbs, if you will. Uh, this is the Cass Street car. Uh, ran out to the east side of town. And so these uh, streetcars really made going downtown a whole lot easier. Al Tolf followed in the footsteps of, Ade of Adele Faye Williams. I don't know if any of you remember his cartoons that appeared in the Herald News in the 1940s. They were like historic cartoons where he would capture in, in cartoon fashion some uh, historic scene. In this image, Al Tolf reminds his readers of the, of the shrill squealing sound made by the wheels of streetcars when they rounded a corner. This one happens to be by the library. 
Not only did the uh, streetcar provide service within the city of Joliet, but also between towns and cities. This is an interurban car, and it facilitated travel to other cities. In fact, you could go to Chicago by streetcar, Aurora, Chicago Heights, LaSalle, Peru, you know, considerable distances by streetcar. Downtown Joliet was also lifted out of the dirt and mud when the streets were raised and resurfaced during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, construction crews are seen here uh, resurfacing the street, repositioning the streetcar tracks at the intersection of Jefferson and Chicago Street. Roads connecting outlying areas to the city were also improved, uh, described as modern methods of building roads or highways. Um, you did? Where is that? Ingles. Ingles. Wow. There you go. Um, my only comment is uh, these are modern methods of building roads. When I drove here from Colorado, uh, they were still using this method. It was called leaning on their shovels. <laughs> Uh, the only thing missing here are some orange barrels. I rode past a lot of orange barrels and maybe a sign that said next exit uh, food and gas. I was fooled by one of those food and gas exit signs. I, I pulled off in the middle of Nebraska and uh, the only thing I could find at the exit was a Taco Bell. I guess it was food and gas. Huh? I don't know. Oh, that was smelly, wasn't it? Well, Anyhow, let's move along quickly here. Driving on these modern roads in the early 20th century were an increasing number of automobiles, some of which were manufactured in Joliet. This model you'll see upstairs in, in the uh, Welcome Center. Um, this is the economy car. They were manufactured 1909-1910 in Joliet. As you can see, it is chain driven. Uh, has hard rubber tires, wooden spoke wheels, bulb type horn, and the engine is air cooled, as were the passengers and driver, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> come to think of it. Um, this is the economy company's factory, um, the production line. I don't think Henry Ford laid awake nights worrying about this competing with his assembly line. Huh? Um, but there were actually three other uh, uh, cars that were manufactured in Joliet. Uh, none of them lasted for very long, two years at the most. Again, Al Tolf, in one of his uh, kind of whimsical cartoons, uh, kind of depicts the excitement and, and uh, the disturbance created by one of these early horseless carriages. You know, it's, Passengers and pedestrians and horses and dogs and kids in all the excitement of these early cars. There were even buses connecting Joliet with nearby towns. One wonders how comfortable or uncomfortable the passengers were in this Manhattan to Joliet bus as they bumped along the country roads. In this vehicle, if you wanted fresh air, you rolled the windows up. <laughs> Literally, I mean, uh, the curtain you rolled up. There were also trucks uh, like uh, the Joliet Transfer Company's uh, truck used for uh, hauling and so forth. Uh, indeed, trucks became very commonplace during the early 20th century. As long as we're talking about motorized vehicles, can't forget the Joliet Motorcycle Club and their Harleys. I'm not sure how these women managed with their long dresses. Probably very carefully. Huh? Um, historic Route 66 and Lincoln Highway were developed during this emergence of modern Joliet during the early 20th century, and they intersected uh, in downtown Joliet. And uh, although this photo uh, is taken from the 1950s, it gives you an idea of the volume of traffic at the intersection, which is in the upper 
you know, left-hand corner, that's uh, a cast in Chicago up there where it's Scott here in the foreground. But it gives you an idea of the, the uh, volume of traffic on uh, Lincoln Highway and Route 66. Um, where these two historic highways crossed, made Joliet, even then, the crossroads of mid-America. Eventually, several major railroads ran through Joliet with railroad uh, uh, tracks crisscrossing the downtown streets. Uh, Joliet benefited immensely from uh, passenger and freight service, but these trains were a real nuisance and often a danger in the downtown area. And in 1908, agreements were reached with the major railroads to reroute the tracks, get them out of the courthouse yard, and to elevate them above street level, which was a major undertaking. It can't be emphasized enough that helped to modernize Joliet. Uh, it was a $3 million construction project. We're looking kind of Washington Street towards the courthouse here. But Joliet became the envy of other cities that had railroads running through their business districts. Uh, spearheaded by railroads themselves, uh, a plan was developed to build a new railroad station in tandem with the elevation project. And so ground is being broken here in 1911 for the Union Station, uh, constructed by Adam Grove. When it was completed in 1912, Union Station was heralded as the finest train station ever built in a city of Joliet size. And, and maybe it was. I mean, that opening night, you know, guests marveled at the marble, you know, the floors and stairways and, and the arch ceilings and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, Romanesque windows. I mean, it really was quite a train station, more than most people could have imagined for uh, the city of Joliet. Speaking of railroads, the railroad most commonly associated with Joliet is the EJ&E, the Elgin, Joliet, and Eastern Railway. Uh, from its northern terminus in Waukegan, it kind of swung around Chicago, catching Joliet and then over to Indiana. Uh, the EJ&E advertised around Chicago, not through it. And the J um, had, had, you know, had a lot of industrial customers, but the steel mill was the most important. In fact, at, at one time, they were controlled by the same company. So the Jays' fortunes kind of rose and fell with steel production in this region. Over the years, uh, EJ&E provided employment for thousands of people, uh, including newly arrived immigrants. Uh, although the, the J did offer passenger service, this is not the passenger train. Uh, <laughs> these are EJ&E employees posing for a picture. The uh, Early 20th century also saw remarkable changes in water transportation. The old stone bridge at Jefferson Street, you can see the dam there uh, through the arches, uh, very picturesque bridge. But in the early 20th century, this bridge was raised. I don't know if that's R-A-Z-E-D or R-A-I-S-E or both maybe. It was raised. Uh, they blew it out of place. And uh, the old bridge collapsed. It was replaced by these more modern uh, structures. They're, you know, these uh, flat bridges. This is the new Jefferson Street Bridge, and you find these bridges uh, uh, elsewhere in the city. Uh, during uh, construction of the Illinois Waterway through Joliet in the early 30s, it was necessary to remove these flat bridges in order to facilitate commerce on the new waterway. Um, and to accommodate uh, boat and barge traffic, uh, the dam at, Jefferson, uh, at Jackson Street seen here, that had to be removed. The Economy Light and Power Company, the generating station there, had to be removed. These were navigational obstacles on the new waterway. Uh, Crowds of curious onlookers uh, gathered on both sides of the river to watch the dynamite blast that blew up the dam at uh, Jackson Street. This is a geyser of water and debris lifted into the air 
uh, creating a 60-foot hole in, uh, in the dam. Then this old scow was used to dredge the debris uh, from the channel, all of this supervised by the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. In November of 1932, uh, the new lift bridge was officially dedicated, formally opened. Uh, the prediction at that time was that this modern ship canal would launch Joliet into a new period of dynamic industrial and commercial growth, just as the I&M Canal had done 85 years earlier. Mayor Hennessy cut the ribbon. Uh, 2,500 people uh, gathered uh, for this ceremony, and um, the Herald News described it this, it had a, a headline describing it this way, Waterway to Spur Industry Here. And uh, that was good news because in 1932, what was going on? Depression. The Depression. So something needed to spur jobs and industry. When the uh, waterway was opened in 1933, this is one of the, the uh, first boats, a tugboat and barge seen here, heading north uh, under the raised arms of the Jefferson Street Bridge. It was such a novelty. People get out of their cars and, you know, watch the bridge action and, you know, the, the uh, tug and the, the barge go by. Uh, don't do that much anymore, do we? Yeah? Oh, bridge! <laughs> I got one today, as a matter of fact. I didn't get out of my car. Um, an even greater transportation novelty in the early 20th century was aviation. In 1911, 10,000 people crowded into Delwood Park in Lockport to watch Joliet's Great Aviation Meet, as it was advertised. Uh, this is pilot J.J. Frisbee in the cockpit. I always thought that was a good name, a frisbee, you know, <laughs> for <laughs> some airborne. Uh. Anyway, it, he, uh, he performed daring dives and even demonstrated the potential military value of planes by dropping flower bags on targets uh, to the amusement of the spectators who had gathered. However, Joliet really entered the age of flight in 1930 when the Park District built the municipal airport. Fifty teams of horses, 200 workers leveled and tiled the airfield uh, so there would be a smooth, grassy surface. And then during the Depression, the WPA provided assistance to um, uh, poor concrete runways. This was Joliet's flying ace, Arthur Chester. And he was... Uh, involved in the uh, air show, very spectacular air show, when the airport was dedicated. He won uh, several of the contests. They had races and, and uh, balloon bursting contests and that sort of thing in the air. Besides transportation, there was also a major breakthrough in communications between this 1870s to 1930 time frame. In 1880, telephone service came to Joliet. These are some of the early operators. Number, please. Is this the party to whom I am speaking? <laughs> it is. Uh, during this, uh, this period around the turn of the century, the stone business remained fairly strong but it was soon eclipsed by steel as a more prominent industry. The Joliet City Council offered a bonus of $75,000 for an iron mill to be built in Joliet. It's a lot of money in 1869 and took a lot of foresight, you know, they, they knew what would happen. Build the iron, later steel mill, and it's going to attract other companies as well. And, uh, you know, Joliet had good transportation system, close to natural resources, abundance of water, and uh, when the cornerstone was laid at the mill, uh, the local newspaper put it this way. This event opened a new era in Joliet history, marking the transition from a dead, grass-grown country town to a modern manufacturing city. It was 1869, so 
you know, someone kind of looked ahead, saw what was happening, and said, you know, things are things uh, good. Things are going to happen here. Once again, uh, Adele Faye Williams. Uh, not only did she look at the past, but she also, you know, in her drawings presents what was happening then. With the smoke billowing, billowing from its stacks, this uh, mill depicted by Adele Faye Williams uh, symbolized Joliet's uh, new industrial image. Like a magnet, other companies came, companies primarily that used iron or steel in production. This is the Phoenix Horseshoe Company. Uh, here they are forming bars into which the horseshoes will be made, or from which the horseshoes will be made. Um, and here workers are sorting and uh, packing horseshoes into the kegs. Even though, you know, the horseless carriage, uh, you would think would put a real dent in business. In 1926, the Phoenix Company was producing 68 million horseshoes annually for shipment all over the world. The Bates Machine Company, uh, it started business in Joliet and uh, within a few years had a plant on Henderson Avenue. The company designed and manufactured a variety of products including the Bates Corliss engine. Uh, and the Bates steel mule. This is the Bates Corliss engine. It's a stationary steam engine with this huge flywheel that uh, provided mechanical power for um, uh, factories and mills and also drove dynamos to generate electricity. By the 1920s, the Bates company pretty much was focusing on uh, the manufacture of the Bates steel mule. These uh, crawler type tractors with treads that were designed to operate in uh, wet and sandy conditions. Moore stoves manufactured in Joliet for some 80 years. By the 1930s, the Moors had 500 employees. Uh, here are some folks taking a break in the mold room. But, uh, you know, they manufactured kitchen stoves like the Bluebird model seen here. Uh, you could get them uh, very basic in black or nickel uh, plated or colored porcelain. Uh, this particular model has six burners, a glass oven door, even a thermometer. And this is one of Moore's heaters. Okay, it also came in a variety of finishes. It burned both wood and coal which created some residue under the firebox and a rather unpleasant job disposing of ashes for someone in the house. Another important steel-related industry was barbed wire. It was first, barbed wire was first produced where? DeKalb, invented in DeKalb, yes. And, but Joliet became, you know, a very important center for the perfection and production of barbed wire. In fact, Joliet people, held 35 patents to different uh, designs for barbed wire. The General Refractories Company uh, manufactured brick. Uh, this was an ideal place for a brick company because the steel mill needed silica, fire brick, so did the, the coke plant and other companies in the area. These were the, the ovens, if you will, the kilns where bricks were baked seven to nine days at temperatures of about 2,500 degrees. Guess who noticed those interesting beehive-shaped kilns? And, and again, in the Herald News, Adele Faye Williams uh, presented this drawing and an accompanying article for her readers. Uh, th these folks uh, were employees at General Refractories. Uh, by 1930, the brick company was making 150,000 bricks a day. I pictured here are some gold brickers sitting down on the job. <laughs> oh. <sighs> We're almost there, folks. Hang in there. Beginning in the 1920s and continuing for several years, Joliet was the leading manufacturer of wallpaper. 
There were six major wallpaper companies, including the Lennon Company, which we see here. Uh, the wallpaper companies uh, uh, did employ a lot of female employees, women like those pictured here. Uh, these wallpaper companies produced 100 million rolls of wallpaper every year. And every day they, they produced enough wallpaper to reach in a belt from Joliet to New York City and back again, one day production. I mean, it was the wallpaper capital of the world, or at least of the United States. <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, go too far with that. Uh, another important Joliet company with hundreds of female employees was Gerlach Barklow. Now, beginning in 1907, the Gerlach Company produced, again, for national distribution, uh, calendars, greeting cards, uh, postcards, blotters, novelty items. Uh, these uh, women pictured here, and look how, you know, how many tables there are uh, of employees putting the final touches on calendars and greeting cards and, and things of ribbons and, you know, things of that sort. The company commissioned artists like uh, Zula Kenyon and uh, Adelaide Hebel to paint images for its calendars like beautiful women and children and animals and landscapes. Uh, and then uh, they were photographed, the, the, the uh, paintings were photographed, and artists like this would touch up the photographs for the printing process. When a local 16-year-old beauty named Lois DeLander was crowned Miss America by Bob Hope of all in 1927, oh, he around a long time, wasn't he? Uh, the Gerlach Barklow uh, secured uh, uh, the rights to her image to use on calendars and cards and that sort of thing. And here, artist uh, Adelaide Hebel is putting the finishing touches on, on that portrait, which uh, hung for years, I think, in the Rialto. Who's got it? <laughs> I don't know where it is. Um, well, although there were these companies that produced wallpaper, calendars, greeting cards, and so forth, Joliet was primarily known as, the, as a blue-collar, uh, ethnically diverse, smokestack, piercing the skyline sort of city. Uh, but nonetheless, there were uh, really a lot of opportunities in the Joliet area during this coming of the modern period for entertainment and intellectual growth. For example, in 1924, start there, uh, excavation is underway for a new theater, a movie palace, the Rialto. And this is the way the Herald News described it. Noisily gnawing into the ground a steam shovel. And it is, look at the steam. Uh, is digging the foundation for a commanding new structure. Uh, the Rubens family invested more than $2 million in the Rialto. A lot of money in 1924, five, six in there. Uh, taking every precaution, a load of 110,000 pounds was used to test the strength of the balcony. See it up there with all the executives? <laughs> the worker standing under the test load <laughs> were extremely confident in the quality of their work. Had it started creaking a little, uh, I'm not sure how fast they could have moved. Uh, the Rialto balcony, incidentally, uh, it was simply spectacular when it was finished and very safe. Uh, this is the opening day in, on May 24th, 1926. People were anxious to go in and see for themselves uh, what the Herald News had been describing. Uh, and it was just simply terrific. Uh, you know, they were in awe of, you know, the the uh, huge columns and vaulted ceilings and plaster reliefs and, you know, uh, wall-length mirrors and draperies and magnificent chandel. In, right here in Joliet. I mean, it, it was amazing. Uh, are, are you starting to feel that, you know, it's this and this and this and this? And, and, you know, it's all building. Joliet really was, is, well, was, we're talking about the was part of it, 
uh, quite a place. In addition to the Rialto, in terms of uh, cultural, intellectual uh, opportunities, uh, the Joliet Public Library uh, was open in 1903, designed by uh, Burnham, Daniel Burnham, you know, an architect uh, known nationally for his role in the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Joliet's commitment to excellence in education can be seen during this period in a number of new grade schools being built. These are just a few of them. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are still serving the community quite well. The most notable achievement in educational excellence was the construction in 1901 of a very modern high school, Joliet Township High School. It was designed by F.S. Allen. The new school was built largely out of Joliet limestone, although it had a lot of marble in it, Vermont marble, the wainscoting, the stair tread, the, the uh, hallways, um, and also some Tennessee marble accenting it. Uh, the school had been uh, 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 designed for 1,400 students, even though there were only 600 students at the time. Imagine the foresight. Uh, so there are 87 rooms, could accommodate 1,400 students, only 600 attended at the time. When the building was dedicated, the board president, A.O. Marshall, described the building this way. It is the pride of Joliet and a monument to the liberality and enterprise of its people. The superintendent at that time was J. Stanley Brown very progressive educator with a brand new building and a lot of extra space and some visionary ideas. What did Brown do in 1901? J.D. Ross, where are you? What are you? <laughs> he started a two-year postgraduate program. So for high school graduates, they could get the first two years of college. At first, it was just called the postgraduate program. And there are only six students. But eventually, it evolves into Joliet Junior College. And, uh, you know, JJC today marks its beginning in 1901 and boasts the title of America's oldest public community college. Again, can you imagine this happening in Joliet? It's amazing. Sound like a cheerleader, don't I? <laughs> well, as the modern city of Joliet began to take shape, obviously public health care needed to be improved. A small group of Franciscan sisters founded the first hospital. In 1881, the sisters had helped nurse Joliet people through a typhoid epidemic. And the following year, they bought a convent on Broadway, remodeled it, and it became St. Joe's Hospital. On the east side of town, in Ridgewood, Silver Cross Hospital began accepting patients in 1895. And so there is modern health care services on both sides of town, east and west. Attention is also given to recreation and relaxation. During the early 20th century, uh, this small boat, the Welcome, took people down the i and Canal, which was still operational, down about six miles down the canal to Rock Run Park. Rock Run Park was a favorite place to enjoy picnics. Uh, small businesses had picnics there, Sunday schools and so forth. And uh, they, there was croquet and lawn games and that sort of thing. But the big attraction at Rock Run was the big chute. A toboggan slide into the water. The slide provided thrills for thousands of picnickers. I guess you'd say it's the first splash park huh? uh, in the Joliet area. The toboggan is uh, pictured here just hitting the water, you know, spraying the, the, uh, the people on the ride. Another park nearby that Joliet residents enjoyed was Electric Park. It was built on the DuPage River and uh, a lot of folks from Joliet went there by streetcar. We're looking uh, at 
some of the activities, uh, the facilities on one side. Uh, the far left is a refreshment area, bowling alley, two-lane bowling alley, uh, a circular dance pavilion, merry-go-round, and also a water slide. Uh, so kids would go racing up to the top of the water slide and then come flying down that wooden slide, remove any slivers they might have picked up, <laughs> and do it again. Uh, what fun. Uh, the EJ&E had annual picnics, and some years they had a picnic at Electric Park. And I have a short, he said short, please make it short, God, please make it short, <laughs> if I can find it here. A short clip, please play. <laughs> it's not going to play. I had a short, I had a short clip here would get, oh, here's the EJ&E train coming to Electric Park in Plainfield. It's about a minute and a half long, so. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. I'm, there's the engine. <laughs> who does that? The fireman, the engineer? Charlie, who's, who pulls that? That's the, engineer. That's the engineer. Now you can see, the reason I show you, you can see some of the park in the background. We're going to see the, uh, the the baseball field, the grandstands, uh, and this whole picnic is provided by the EJ&E. When they come in, this is 20s, you know, 26. Look how they're dressed, shirts, ties, huh? Like me, wearing a tie. Can you imagine that? Uh, now they're playing a little softball. Oh, get him, get him, get him. Okay. Well, oh, they're going. Fans are going crazy. <laughs> Huh? And you can see some of the cabins in the background at Electric Park, uh, the boating area. And then we had some swimming races at the picnic. Oh, look at that. Late to the race. EP, they rented those, Electric Park, EP, those swimsuits they got at the park. The diving, it's only about four feet deep, watch out. The sign should say no diving. But it, oh, they have races, women, oh! Oh, that'll hurt tomorrow. She whiz. Watch out. Oh, down again. Man, the end of a perfect day. 7,000 people uh, came to uh, the park for that picnic. Delwood Park in Lockport was another, you know, favorite place uh, for Joliet people to go. Again, by streetcar. Streetcar company built and maintained Delwood Park. Uh, the scenic railway in Delwood Park was one of the main attractions. Uh, the car on the scenic railway would slowly climb the incline and then go down the other side. Uh, it wasn't quite like the death-defying roller coasters we have today, but kind of fun for the kids. Uh, at Delwood Park, the tower was one of the most distinctive landmarks. When lighted at night, a eh, nice place for a stroll with someone special. Uh, and the EJ&E had picnics also at Delwood Park. Again, we have about a minute here if I can get this one to play. This time, instead of coming by train, they're coming by streetcar. The safety committee at the J put on these uh, picnics. They sponsored them and did all the games and everything. Here they are entering the park. Hey, you're on camera. I know. And now they're from the street. Hey, look at Hey, get out of there. You're trying to see other people take a picture of us. Everybody join in. Boost for safety. Employees picnic. This is the, the next year, 1927. Horseshoes. Look at the little kid there. <laughs> get out of the way. You're going to get a horseshoe in your neck. Holy cow. It's the safety committee putting this on, folks. Man. Jeez. 
you know, yeah, hi. <laughs> oh, th this is a fun thing. They put their shoes in a pile. Now they have to race down there, find their shoes, put them on, and run back. I smell mine under there. Give me mine. Oh, look, the little tug of war. Look at the guy pounding on him. Come on, come on, come on. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Whoa, come on. No. Oh. Pie eating contest. <laughs> no hands. Huh? Fun times in the 1920s. A company picnics. Uh, Oh, baseball here. Now, this is real baseball. They're not, uh, oh, go, 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 go. Leg it out, leg it out, leg it out. Ooh, take two, take two. There he goes. Oh, they even have the cheering section. Oh, look at the, you love the hairstyles and so forth in the 1920s. Yeah. The merry-go-round at Delwood Park. And they had these funny mirrors where you look all stretched out of shape. Oh, get out of the way. <laughs> Sticking their tongues out, yeah. And then they had this, this parade Everyone by uh, age, you know, the youngest all the way to the oldest, uh, to get on camera because it was a professional company, you know, doing the movie, which uh, went on forever. But we're not going on forever. Um, he said, he promised. Um, so, as we wrap up the program, did he say wrap up? God, I think he did. <laughs> About time. Anyhow, um, We'll go back to the downtown area just very quickly, see a few final images. Um, the modern city, we have a more modern uh, fire department. Uh, instead of the horse-drawn uh, carriages and so forth, we now have motorized vehicles. The, the uh, department is professionally trained and they're all uh, employed. Uh, they're not volunteers anymore. The police department also was motorized. This is the first cop car in 1913, and though they may appear a little like the Keystone Cops, well, maybe not, in their turn of the century uniforms, uh, they did serve and protect the city quite well. Not all of the officers were in four-wheel uh, vehicles. Joliet had a motorcycle division of two uh, on their Harleys. We take one last look at the downtown area. Um, no longer do we see those small frame buildings side by side with the, with the uh, brick and stone buildings. Uh, this is Jefferson Street looking east. You can see the courthouse on the left, uh, the intersection at Chicago, and the Woodruff Inn way in the distance, visible in the distance. Here's the Woodruff Inn on the right-hand side. Um, it's old English architecture, made the hotel a real distinctive landmark for a number of years. The streets outside were often crowded and noisy, but inside in the lobby, uh, the Woodruff had very comfortable furniture, spacious area. There was even a mechanic on duty to service guests' cars. This was truly Joliet's newest five-star hotel. Thank you. Now, I don't know about their towels and whether they were plush and fluffy like the old National Hotel and whether Mr. Lincoln, uh, cut it out, <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, the last three pictures will give us uh, a good, you know, uh, image of how changes took place on Chicago Street from Jefferson. So in 1895, we're looking north on Chicago Street from the Jefferson Street intersection. This is 1895, known as the Gay 90s. Uh, you see women in long dresses on bicycles. Uh, no cars in sight yet, high curbs, unpaved streets, even a little horse pollution on the roadway there. About 15 years later, 
Now we're looking at 1913, quite a bit of change. Uh, now there are hardly any horse-drawn carriages in sight. Most of them are cars. New modern buildings like the Woodruff Building, later named the Morris Building, on the right-hand side here in this corner. Um, and then if we go about 15 years after that, now we see that in this you know, final snapshot of Chicago Street, cars everywhere on the streets, jammed against the sidewalks. Doesn't it make you wonder how in the world they parallel parked those cars? Look, look how close they are. How did they do that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, they were good. Um, and then way off in the distance, on the right, we see the familiar sign and marquee of the Rialto Theater, the Jewel of Joliet, and a fitting place to end the presentation. And so in summary, we've seen amazing changes in Joliet during this period from the 1870s to about 1930, as the city transitioned from a rural agricultural community to a more industrial town, and then to a more dynamic urban center. Uh, there were significant changes in transportation on the water, rails with the elevation and so forth, uh, on the roadways, um, and you know, smokestack industries, the steel mill and all those other related industries, leading wallpaper manufacture, leading calendar manufacture, um, brand new high school, people from all over the country came to see uh, Joliet Township High School and the beginning of the first community college in the nation. So it was really a rather remarkable period of time as Joliet emerged from the early years into a more modern period. This one. Thank you. I apologize for going so long. Um, the, uh, <laughs> he wants another hour. <laughs> another hour? Oh my goodness, they want to leave, huh? Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's been great being with you. I see so many familiar faces, a lot of close friends and other friends I haven't seen in a while. And uh, so thank you all for coming. If there are any questions, we won't keep people sitting here. We'll just do that one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, here after the program. And you're going to be in the back signing books. <laughs> did you bring your stamp? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Thank you, Dr. Sterling, so much. We really appreciate you doing this program, and we're thrilled to have you back. Thank you. So, at this time, if you would like to go up into the galleries, you are more than welcome to do that. I believe there's still some wine and refreshments in the back. Wine. Wine. <laughs> I've been, I've been dragging this thing on, and there's wine back there. We've been tipping what? it till no. <laughs> well, you didn't say that earlier. There's wine. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Again, thank you for coming out on this gorgeous afternoon. I really appreciate thank your you. support. Thanks. Uh, the exhibit runs, I believe, through June eighth. Uh, June eighth, I believe.